Right, uh, good evening everybody and uh, welcome to these deliberations in obstetrics and gynecology. We are having a quick fire session, we are going to discuss about the images right, which uh, are coming into the uh, 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 exams and we know that uh, most of these uh, images have uh, an impact on our uh, understanding of the subject better so that, uh, you know, I always say that whenever you see a picture in a book uh, and you're reading your subject and you see a book, then uh, make sure that you're reading about that picture a little bit because what happens that uh, invariably the knowledge is associated with that picture and uh, you have a, you know, understanding of that subject better if you have this photographic memory and you relate your knowledge with that. So, uh, you know, sometimes these pictures are just a, uh, uh, you know, a method for you, for, for us, it's just a method for us to start asking questions based on that topic. So at least you should know where these pictures belong. So most of the pictures which I have taken here are the topics which have come in your exams and uh, let's see uh, how many of you get correct and I'm sure you'll get most of them correct and uh, I hope all of you do very well in your exams. So let us start right away with these. So let's start with this one picture of the fetal head and I'm showing you this head from the top and um, I've put two red lines here. I don't know if you can uh, uh, answer. Yeah, I think we can all uh, discuss here. Hi, good evening, everybody, and welcome to see all of you once more. And uh, okay, I'll send my hi. Now, you can send me, um, what is the diameter of the first area, which is box blue? This one, what is the diameter of this one? And then the one in yellow, yes. You can see the first diameter, the one which is box blue, this diameter here, and the second diameter is here. Tell me. Yes, these are very simple questions. Only thing, you should have a visual uh, method of realizing what we are asking you. These are, I mean, if I ask you the diameters otherwise, you will pop out with the answers immediately. So yes, the first one is, of course, the uh, bi-temporal diameter, the first one. Okay, you have to understand, see, um, you know, this frontal here is the anterior frontal anterior frontal is between four bones uh, there are two frontal bones and two parietal bones so this is the anterior frontal it has these uh, one two three four bones so this is a four uh, edged four edged frontal a quadrilateral frontal so when you do a per vaginal examination you know uh, you cannot make out uh, you cannot see a baby through the vagina when the patient's in the labor room so how do you make out that uh, there is a baby with uh, occipital anterior occipital posterior so what we do we do a per vaginal examination and we feel the mostly the occiput bone so how do i know i'm feeling the occiput because just near the occiput there's a frontal which is triangular because Parietal bones are two, but occipital bone is only one. So that frontal is triangular, and the one in the front, which is the bregma, it's a quadrilateral frontal. So the antifrontal, I'm showing you here. And what is the diameter? Here, this diameter is the bitemporal diameter. The bitemporal diameter, and this bitemporal diameter is yes, it is eight centimeters. Okay. Now, the one which is on the back, the one which is the broadest diameter of the fetus, all right? Uh, the broadest diameter of the fetus is the biparietal diameter. The one is here and that is 9.5 centimeters. So, broadest is 9.5 and bitemporal is 8. But yes, which one is the narrowest diameter of narrowest transverse diameter? It is the bi mastoid so the bi mastoid diameter that is 7.5 centimeters so the narrowest transverse diameter is the bi mastoid so let's see what you guys are doing okay um Hi guys, um, Dr. Reddy and thanks for all that. Uh, will come vacuum cup placed there. So when will vacuum cup placed here? So yes, vacuum can be placed uh, on the part which is, uh, generally they say you can put on the one of the parietal bones, but that's not easy. So we put it on the vertex, it's easy. Mostly will come on, we'll put it on the vertex, the area of the vertex we'll put, and it is not going to hurt the baby if the front end is involved in that vacuum suction of uh, minus 600. Uh, so that suction is not going to harm. Don't worry about that. So we say the vacuum is put on the most uh, prominent part of the head and that is a vertex. And you try to put it on one of the parietal bones, but even if it is involving the frontal, it's not going to be a problem. So we can put, but yes, 
what is the centimeters beyond which we can put a vacuum theoretically it can be put even after any time after six centimeters because we know the vacuum cup is as big as six centimeters so seven eight nine centimeters also when the service is dilated you can put the vacuum but forceps please forceps can never be put less than the cervix less than i mean fully dilated till the cervix is fully dilated you cannot put the forceps so forceps only when the cervix is completely dilated vacuum theoretically after but i would preferably put a vacuum even after when it is nine centimeters or completely dilated i would preferably not want to tax the cervix and get the cervical lips in the vacuum you know so i would want to put it best at fully dilated vacuum also theoretically you can put after six centimeters so i i hope that is what you were asking me okay fine so we got the diameters correct so let's move on by master diameter i've already told you is 7.5 centimeters and by temporal is eight so which is the broadest part of the baby the broadest part of the baby is always the by parietal diameter don't say shoulders you see if you look at my shoulders they're broader than my head obviously because i'm a well-grown man but in a fetus the broadest part of the baby is the by parietal diameter of course sometimes the shoulders are big sometimes the shoulders can be big in a case when there is a a uh, baby who is uh, a baby to a mother with diabetes and the baby has uh, high sugar so he grows and his shoulders are quite big so the bipedal diameter is the broadest sometimes the shoulders can be big so the head comes out but the shoulder is stuck so they can be a shoulder distortion we know that very well but that is not very common the broadest diameter of the baby is always the bipedal diameter all right let's move on and see and can you tell me what is the name of the instrument which is marked in yellow see there's a doctor here one of my uh, postgraduates she's uh, putting this instrument on the maternal abdomen to hear the fetal heart rate so that's the hint it's here it's to hear the fetal heart rate the low frequency fetal heart rate can be heard wonderfully with this instrument so what do you think is that instrument yes i'm sure you'll get this one easily uh, yes uh, fetoscope that's not enough guys Fetoscope se nahi chalega. Ah, what, what fetoscope is that known as? Oh, he, you. You guys all wrote fetoscope. That is correct. It is known as the fetoscope. It's the Pinard's. Yes. It's the Pinard's fetoscope. Yes. Pinard's fetoscope. Fetoscope alone won't do. You have to tell me what fetoscope is this. It's the Pinard's fetoscope. All right. Chalo. Yes, some of you have written that. Okay, let's move on and see. Pinard's fetoscope is, of course, we can uh, mostly hear the fetal heart sound by the stethoscope. That's what we do by the low frequencies, best heard by the bell. And uh, traditionally, we used to hear, and all my professors, I remember they used to, we used to have the stets as postgraduates in the wards. And uh, when uh, my professor wanted to see the fetal heart rate, I'll give my stethoscope. He'll say, no, get me the fetoscope. I'll be happy with the Pinard's. So, yes, in India, we have this um, aluminium or steel fetoscope of Pinard's. But yes, most of the Western countries, they use the wooden one because the countries are very cold. And in that cold uh, country, and if you have this uh, metal uh, instrument, it's going, to be, it's going to be a sudden shock, you know, cold shock on the abdomen because the abdomen will be quite warm. So it's nice that uh, you are polite and use a wooden fetoscope in those countries. So I'm saying that some of you people who have done your training in, let's say, in uh, Russia or in uh, China, and uh, there you will see this fetoscope. It, they are very traditional, these Russian doctors. They use this fetoscope just like our traditional gynecologists, the Pinard fetoscope. And of course, you can use a steth also. What is the other method by which you can, uh, what is the other method by which you can see the fetal well-being? Electronic fetal uh, monitoring, you can use a Doppler also. We can put a Doppler on the metal abdomen. So we'll come to all of that when we move on. So yes, what is this test? Yes, now I want you to answer, you know, I'm, I'm a little um, uh, a little upset that quite a few of you missed this easy picture. There's a pregnant lady and we're doing a test in this pregnant lady. And what do you think this test is? Yes, uh, let's see. No, there's nothing called a stress test. We'll not give a stress. We'll say NST. Now, yes, uh, somebody has answered uh, CTG or somebody is saying not CTG. Cardiotocography, Sithij. Uh, no, CTG, Vandana. Look, uh, now that's what I wanted some people to commit a mistake. Because see, when I say cardiotoco, there are two things here. Cardio, 
fetal heart rate and toco means uterine contractions. Now that's where we are wrong. See, when I say toco lysis, I mean stopping the uterine contraction. When I say tocography, I mean chart the uterine contraction. So tocography and cardiography together, that means two things, cardio tocography. Here I'm seeing only the fetal heart rate. So this is only the fetal heart rate and I'm not putting any stress on the mother. So this is the non-stress test. It is not the CTG. I know some of you interns and some of your first EPGs, when you are doing this test in the OPD, uh, you call it like that, uh, CTG. you just go and do that CTG. That's the, um, uh, you know, the thing which generally in layman's language, the nurses also call it the CTG. That's why you're getting it wrong. We don't call it the CTG. This is only one probe, so it is non-stress test. See the next picture. I have two probes on this lady's abdomen. So she is in labor. In labor, I will check the uterine contraction and along with the uterine contraction, I'll check the fetal heart rate. So that is a cardiotocography, okay? Along with the uterine contraction, what happens to the fetal heart rate? So that's why I gave both the pictures together. So be very careful. We will give you this picture mostly in the exam and we'll give you the first choice as CTG and you'll mark that and move on, which will be wrong then. Non-stress test. No mother, no stress on the mother, no stress on the baby. Mother is lying down. She's just not being given a meal. Because we know babies are very happy when they get food. Mother takes food, the sugars increase, baby gets sugar, baby starts jumping in the tummy, moving in the tummy. So I want the mother to lie down a little bit on the side and when she's lying down, she has to just notice when the baby is moving. Moment the baby moves in the tummy, she presses a button. So that is like a mark. So yes, her heart rate is going like this, suppose. Now she's uh, lying down here. So the fetal heart rate, let's say, is going like this, tuck, 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 it's at 130, suppose. So tuck, 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 it's going and suddenly the baby moves. So now the heart rate increases. Then again, it increases like that. With every fetal movement, the heart rate should increase. Now that increase should be, yes, it should be at least more than 15 beats. See this, more than 15 beats above from the baseline. So if it is 130, it should go to at least 150 or 145. So see here, it is going from 130 to 150. It's a increase and it should last for more than 15 seconds. So this happening at least twice, more than equal to two times in a 20 minute observation time is a reactive, it's a reactive non-stress test look they will not ask you to write the definition they will write four definitions and ask you to mark the correct one so always say reactive nst is two or more accelerations from the baseline baseline is 120 here it's gone to 150 so it is definitely it's 20 here that means it should be more than 15 how long it should happen at least for 15 seconds how many times it should happen at least twice in a 20 minute observation time so that's why we say Non-stress test, no stress on the mother, no stress on the baby. Just see the movement of the baby and the heart rate should increase. Why does it increase? Because when you and me also move, our heart rate increases. So when the baby moves, the heart rate increases. Sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system's well-being. So if the baby is fine with his movements, the heart rate will increase. So first of all, baby is fine, he will move. And when the baby moves, heart rate should increase adequately, at least 15 beats. So that's what I'm seeing. If that happens, baby is healthy continue the pregnancy now if i want to be more sure i will not do just nst i will do the amniotic fluid index and i will do the fetal movements and i will do the fetal breathing and i'll do the fetal tone so i'll do five parameters sometimes so that becomes the biophysical profile okay so nst is a good test for knowing the fetal well-being which I've showed you. Even better is the biophysical profile. It has got five parameters. Each is given two marks each. So that becomes a good biophysical profile is 10 out of 10. What is a modified biophysical profile? Modified biophysical profile is the NST plus AFI. AIMS question. Very easy question. Sometimes the uh, AIMS means I mean to say INICT. Sometimes they want to just make things very easy for you and give you some, uh, you know, 100 odd questions which are really easy but they decide the rank on the other remaining 100 or 200 questions. But yes, uh, modified biophysical profile is NST plus AFI, you know that very well. 
to tell you. Let's see the next one. Now, this is the cardiotogography. In the cardiotogography, you're seeing the uterine contractions and what happens to the fetal heart rate along with this. So, yes, here the graph is. Here there are, there is two things in the graph. Yes, we are seeing along with the uterine contractions. See, this is the uterine contractions. You see what happens to the fetal heart rate like that, isn't it? So, this is how you see. So, the fetal heart rate along with the toco we call it the toco all right so yes of course uh, i don't know whether you can see that i was just obstructing it i think so when you're talking about the uterine contraction along with the fetal heart rate that is known as the cardiotocography there are two things here okay the same of course the belt is same the same belt here and the same belt here that is for the purpose of the fetal heart rate that's a doppler it's a doppler instrument it's just you can hear the sound also you know you must have seen the um, NHT or the CTG all of that goes on making that sound of the fetal heart rate along with that the uterine contraction with the second probe okay so this is one of the uh, in my hospital uh, uh, we have got this uh, uh, CTG for this patient why am I calling this a CTG because I've got this uterine contractions here can you see that there's a uterine contraction now what is happening to the heart rate here it is going down and picking up so is it a distress is it a fetal distress look now be very careful when we talk about heart rate normal fetal heart rate is 120 to 160 what did you tell me just now is the acceleration anything more than 15 beat is an acceleration so here anything dropping more than 15 beats is deceleration as long as it is between 120 to 160 once more Heart rate is 120, it goes to 140. Acceleration because it's increased by 15 beats at least. It is going at 140, 140, 140, it comes down to 120. Deceleration, not a distress. So between 120 to 160, anybody's heart rate can go, any baby's heart rate can go between 120 to 160 and I'll call it a variation, that's it. In this 120 to 160, we have the deceleration patterns like an early deceleration or a late deceleration. Now here see, this heart rate is not, this uterine contraction is not coinciding with the lowest heart rate. See, it is a little late. See, it is a little late. So this is a late deceleration. You see, the heart rate is come down, but it is not less than 100. So less than 100, or more than 180 that is distress if the heart rate drops from 150 to let's say even 120 it's a 30 heart rate drop 30 beats drop that's all right it is still in the safe range from 120 it goes to 160 acceleration yeah fine it is still in the safe range so between 120 to 160 we talk about deceleration and accelerations and early uh, deceleration and late deceleration like this this is discussed only between 120 to 160. Moment the heart rate is less than 100, it's a distress. Heart rate is of 80, patient is in early labor, heart rate is 80, do a caesarean. Heart rate is 200, she's only 2 centimeters, 3 centimeters, 4 centimeters, again do a caesarean. Anything beyond 180 and lesser than 100 is distress. Between 120 to 160, we are able to say exhalation, deceleration. Now, we are talking of 120 to 160 now. And this is not coinciding late deceleration. This is placental insufficiency. So, hello, I don't tolerate distress. We tolerate some decelerations. Again, I don't tolerate distress. Less than 100, more than 180, I don't tolerate. Between 120 to 160, let's discuss, okay? Decelerations ki baat kar lete ke whether it is less or more and... I am talking between 120 to 160 and between 120 to 160, there is a late deceleration. This itself I don't like. Forget liking any distress. This pattern of deceleration also I don't like. So yes, when a patient has, when a patient has late deceleration, we are very, very cautious. If she is about to delivery, okay, fine, thoda sa tolerate kar lete hain. But if she is having a late deceleration repeatedly, I may do a caesarean. So deceleration is discussed at least distress is not even discussed action immediate action you have to take 
deceleration the late deceleration is not good other two deceleration yes early deceleration you know that is seen in head compression that is seen in head compression and that is normal and then there is a variable deceleration variable deceleration is because of umbilical cord compression so what is the safest deceleration the one which is early this is normal and it is safe variable deceleration mostly safe variable deceleration is mostly safe all right so umbilical cord compression all right guys umbilical cord compression i have written there if you can see umbilical cord compression all right so umbilical cord compression is the variable deceleration and that is the most common deceleration and uh, early deceleration is the safest deceleration but the late deceleration is because of plasmal insufficiency and we don't tolerate that so that was about this so let's see what all you guys have come out with and i've not been seeing your uh, if only heart rate is less than NST, NST, CTG and uh, right, right. Just a minute, I'll see if uh, anything significant you asked. Yes, definition, single vertical pocket. Single vertical pocket, uh, I'll come to that. Single vertical pocket, uh, let me just finish this. Uh, Shouldering. Now, somebody is saying what is shouldering? So that if there is a heart rate which is shoulders like this, shouldering, that is all right. Shouldering in variable deceleration. In variable, just a minute guys, I think I have pressed the wrong. Yes. So when I say shouldering, that these are shoulders. Shouldering is fine. Overshoots this. Overshoots is not fine. Shouldering, this is shouldering. Shoulders. So somebody's asked me about this, so I thought I might as well tell you this. This is seen in variable decelerations. So variable deceleration is mostly normal. And variable deceleration may have some shouldering. That's all right. Some early before it goes down and uh, slight uh, when it is recovering, there might be a shoulder. Shouldering is fine. But overshoots are not fine. When they're overshoots, these are not very good patterns. So yes, variable deceleration is a very interesting uh, uh, topic. And uh, some other forum, I think I should uh, spend some time with you guys regarding this. So let's move on. And somebody was asking... Um, Hi, Nikhil. Love you too. So, what are we discussing? We are talking about the um, single pocket. My friend was saying, what is a single pocket criteria? So, anytime, I am not a fluid index. I was telling you this. Rich, here, I told you AFI somewhere here. Anyway, I am not a fluid index. Anytime, AFI, anytime. One pocket less than two is oligo amnios. Any pocket more than eight is polyhydramnios. Single pocket. If single pocket criteria is taken. So, uh, you know, AFI is normally around 10 to 15 centimeters. And uh, yes, uh, might as well discuss what is the, um, what is the uh, Liker maximum. Maximum amount of Liker is 1000 ml and it is at 32 to 34 weeks. Please, no more discussion. Khatam. Mene bol diya, khatam. Don't talk, don't discuss, don't argue. 32 to 34, it is coming in exams. And all my friends who are teaching, they all agree 32 to 34. So all the gynecologists have taught you that. And one of them will come in exams, 32 or 34 Aiga. And uh, 32 came in one of the MCI exams. I don't know whether the AIMS guys, uh, INICT guys have seen that exam. But uh, MCI questions are getting a little uh, more uh, tougher than the PG entrance I'm seeing recently. So whenever you have time, um, all the students who are writing the INICT exam, Please go ahead and uh, see the MCI questions. They are getting quite a bit of uh, good clinical questions there. So uh, good uh, revision for you guys. So please, like a maximum 32 to 34 weeks. It is 1000 ml. After that, the like reduces. That's why I can do external cephalic version at 36 weeks. You should at least have this correlation in your mind. Why do I do external cephalic version at 36 weeks? Why not at 40 weeks then? Because if the liker is increasing in 40 weeks, I should be able to do external cephalic version then. Liker is still increasing. No. 
we want the Likert to now reduce so that suppose this is the fetus in a breech position. This is the head and this is the breech. So if I turn a baby, see, if I turn this baby like this, so it should not return back. It should not go back. So to make sure it is not going back, to make sure it is not going back, I want to do this external cephalic version after the Likert is reducing. That is 36 weeks, 37 weeks. So that's why it's very easily understood only the liker is going lower than the highest, then we can do external cephalic version. So at least with that reasoning, you will understand that liker is maximum before 36 weeks, that is 32 to 34 weeks. After that, it is only reducing. Okay? Chalo. So vertical pocket ho gaya, ye ho gaya. Now, WHO semen analysis. I've given you 2010, the old wala and the new wala. I have not written many things. Let's see if you can fill in the blanks for me. Volume guys, come on, tell me. Let's see. Let's finish this off together. Yes, come on, guys. Yes, Nikhil, you're correct. Um, it will not come back. Come on, guys. Let's see. Let's see volume first. Yes, Vandana, you're correct. Volume. Not 1.5, Deepak. 1.5 to purana wala hai na. To kush to dekho. Let me tell you. See, it's a very uh, good chart because all the ones in dark, the ones in black, there are few in blue, they have changed. The ones in black are the ones which are the same values as last year. So last uh, analysis, WHOC analysis, 2010, the values have changed for 2021. The five percentile values are the ones which I'm going to tell you. Those 2020, 10, also these are the five percentile, Matlab, at least this much. 5 to 95 percentile, all of you know, is normal. So we say that uh, 5 centile and below. So 5 centile values are what? 1.5, 15, 39, 40, 32, 58, 4 in 2010. What is it in 2021? The one in dark black, the black 39, 4 and less than 1 million. These are still the same. So please remember, even before I tell you the other values, morphology. Morphology is going to be. Morphology is going to be a question because this is still the same. Mostly yehi aane wala hai. But let us do the exercise of knowing all of these properly. So yes, what are you guys telling me? 2 ml to bhoat purana ho gaya guys. 2 ml to bhoat, that's ages old value. 2000. <laughs> guys, 2020, 10 say we are writing 1.5. Ab ho gaya hai, bhoat major change a gaya hai. 1.5 say 1.4 ho gaya such a lot of research has gone in to make it 1.4. 15 million say concentration ho chuka hai. 16 million. You have to mug it up. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm a little amazed that uh, we did such a lot of work, WHO guys and so many scientists. From 1.5 it's reduced to 1.4. From 15 million it's gone to 16 million. I mean, what major difference that has made? Anyway, so that's my personal look at this because, uh, you know, my PGs and my uh, fellows have to learn this and they keep messing it up. And I said, it's not a big deal yet. How much difference does it make? I mean, like a guy who passed with 1.5 ml last year, this year he's failed because he's got one point. I mean, just imagine, yeah, you know, 15 million was passed last time and it is 16 million this year. So that's why I'm not really very impressed by this major change which they have done which is actually not a major change. 40% has gone, total motility gone to 42%. Active motility from 32% has become 30%. Vitality from 58 has gone to 54%. And the morphology and the pus cells are still the same. So yes, nothing great has changed, guys. Let's move on and see. Uh, Dr. Knight is, Dark Knight is getting a little upset with this. <laughs> I know, what the hell, I'm also upset, but uh, these are the new values, you have to mug them up. So I've given the old and the new, please mug them up nicely. Okay, chalo. What type of fibroid am I discussing here? There's a picture and this one of my patients, see this is the fallopian tube here. See, this is the ovary here. Okay, and this is the uterus. Okay, this is the uterus. So I'm going to it so that you can see what I'm trying to show you. So now tell me, if this is the uterus, what type of fibroid by the FIGO classification, what type of fibroid am I showing you here? Yes. Though, see, I'm pointing with the artery forceps here. Pedunculated se nahi chalega. Type, type uh, 0 to type 8 mein bataiye mujhe. Old fashioned mat batao. Pedunculated subserous fibroid to 
یو نو ایم بی بی ایس میں بتاتے ہیں بچے آج کل آپ کو فیگو کلاسیفیکیشن آف فائبرائڈ فیدرے سیوں انٹرنیشنلے جنیکولوجی این آف تریتری سیوں آئی ہوپ آئی گا دیٹ رائٹ انٹرنیشنل فیڈریشن آف گانا کالجیس این آف سٹریشن کلاسیفیکیشن آل کینسرز آل کینسرز ان گائنی آب آئی فیگو این نو دس فیگو کلاسیفیکیشن آف فائبرائڈ ایز دے بتائیے Yes, that is type 7, not a type 6. Type 6 is like this. Whoever wrote type 6, let me show you. Type 6 is majorly outside, but still somewhat here. And a type 5 is, I'm sorry, type 5 is majorly inside type 5. Oh, this is touching. That is wrong. It should not be touching. Type 5 is here. Type 6 is here. So type 5 majorly inside here in the uterus. And partly here. Type 6 majorly outside but here. And of course, uh, this is a type 7 subserous pedunculated. So yes, uh, what is this one? Next one, come on. So this is subserous pedunculated. Pedunculated, yeah, pedunculated. Anything hanging, anything hanging we say pedunculated. Like you see inside the uterus. Inside the uterus there is a fibroid hanging. So we say it's a type 0. It's a type 0. It's a sub mucosal submucosal and pedunculated submucosal and pedunculated type 0 the one which is hanging inside the uterus okay uh, what did you miss guys type 7 yes I'm so sorry I should not be writing behind my head okay uh, okay you got that right I think uh, it's always getting wrong by me نکھل نہیں یار آ جائے گا تجھے یہ میرا جو پچر ہے یہ جو میں نے آپ کو دیا ہے ہو سکتا آپ کے اگزام میں اسے بہت کلیر آ جائے don't get upset by getting a question wrong it is just an idea that see I can show you pictures of only what I have done in my life because see we have copyright issues and I cannot just pick up pictures from here and there so I am showing you the pictures of what I have done as surgeries in my life most of them some pictures we do get references from here and there تو ہو سکتا ہے کہ جو آپ کو the picture which you see in the exam will be much more clearer so don't don't be in despair you'll get it right I'm sure so what is this picture that is another of my favorite pictures this has come in previous image base because every image base I put this picture yes what type of fibroid is this first of all which is the fibroid the one here on the top or the one here on the bottom so yes let me I don't want to make Type 8, uh, Lalton pattern. Yes, Deepak Sahu. I'm so happy. Type 6, yaar, Anjana and uh, Dr. Doctor. Yes, it's a cervical fibroid. Cervical fibroid, yes. Cervical fibroid is the one which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, shown here. So, this is the uterus. Hai. Ye upar yahan pe uterus hai. This is the uterus, guys. And this uterus is having a cervix. See, this is the cervix, antelope, and this is the posterior lip. But you're not able to see this so nicely because the cervix is engulfed with a fibroid. So yes, cervical fibroid is type 8. Cervical and parasitic fibroid is type 8. So this is a cervical fibroid. And yes, it does look like that, uh, you know, Lalton on the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral. When this was taught to me in my college in Jipma, so of course all of my professors, they're all, you know, the government uh, hospitals and they all go for fellowships and... Uh, you know, they all work uh, in the West and they all knew this, you know, they are all gone to London, they are all seen the St. Paul's Cathedral. I mean, we of course had not seen and to know that this is uh, Lalton on the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral, this view is exactly like this, guys. Yeah, provided you know where is St. Paul's Cathedral and provided you know that on the dome there is a Lalton which is there, so then you know this view. But anyway, this is not coming in exams. I am just trying to tell you that some references are so uh, difficult for us to correlate uh, people of people like us who are in India have not seen all these places so we have to go ahead and see Google thanks to Google we know this now and thanks to Google I also have seen it now <laughs> I was in um, uh, I mean of course I didn't have the uh, you know the chance to see this when I was in London I should have seen this but St. Paul's Cathedral there is this dome that uh, Lalton this looks just like this anyway what is this type of placenta depicted in this picture? Yes, this is the one which has uh, recently come in the exam. One of the exams you got this. Can you see the placenta here? I'll try to help you. The placenta is here. The umbilical cord is here like this. Okay. But can you see the membranes? 
the membranes are folded on the periphery because yes the because yes the chorion the placenta also known as chorion is smaller than the amnion when the chorion is smaller than the amnion then the membranes get folded you know if you see if you imagine my hand as the placenta and my other hand as the membrane so these are both same size but what happens the chorion is small the chorion is small so the amnion is all over it like this all on the circumference so yes uh, who all got it correct circumvallate yes correct circumvallate is the correct answer for this circumvallate placenta it is associated with abruption abruption and it is associated with uh, intrauterine growth restriction some people say even preterm labor but yes IUGR and abruption you should know well okay that is the circumvallate placenta now this is the question which has come in uh, your exams recently they're very happy asking you occipital posterior by the way, occipital posterior, INICT, favorite MCQ, especially AIMS exam. Occipital posterior, forget this question. I'll just change it. Just don't read it. Just listen to me. What is the management when you examine a lady in labor and you find out the head is in occipital posterior? In early labor at 4 centimeters cervical dilatation, what is your management? There is just one statement, wait and watch. That is the answer. Because occipital posterior will turn to occipital anterior and deliver as occipital anterior. Sometimes it stays occipital posterior, it delivers as phase two pubis. Sometimes it rotates half to occipital transverse. Then I put my hand inside and rotate and make him occipital anterior and deliver it with the forceps. So yes, I told you three, occipital posterior will deliver. Yes, if it is neglected and it is deep transverse rest, Transverse may aake ruk gaya and it is neglected for hours. She has come from a village and there is a deep transfer rest. So if I say deep transfer rest, go ahead and do a cesarean. Otherwise, occipital posterior, wait and watch, it will deliver. So that's the next question. When I ask you this question, if all of these, all of these pelvis, four pelvis I've shown you, gynecoid, anthropoid, android and platyploid. If all of these have occipital posterior position, then rotation to occipital anterior is po best possible in which one? First of all, let us just know most common pelvis is gynecoid and the second most common is anthropoid and the rarest is platyploid. And this platyploid has generally phase. So, let's leave this. Now, occipital posterior, this one, this one and this one so obviously when you see the sacral promontory sacral promontory here when you see the sacral promontory it is obviously the posterior part of the pelvis so if i say the arrow the arrow head is the occiput so there is occipital posterior in these three pelvis most common pelvis is gynecoid now if you see the gynecoid pelvis the pelvis is nice and round cavity you see the anthropoid, see here, the side walls are, the side walls are actually parallel, the side walls are actually parallel to each other. So there's a compression from both the sides. There's a compression from both the sides. The side walls are narrow, it's they are, they are parallel to each other. So android, android, the front of the pelvis is narrow so you see the force of contraction the the force of constriction the pelvis so if you see the anthropoid side walls are parallel you see the android the four walls the front of the pelvis is jutting in so there is less space so only round pelvis is the gynecoid so in gynecoid rotation is best possible in android this much rotation may happen the head may rotate this much to occipital transverse it will rotate to occipital transverse from occipital posterior this much rotation is possible rest you can do manual rotation forceps extraction so yes in a case of android it rotates half to transverse rest you can manually rotate and take out with a forceps but in a case of anthropoid, no rotation. See, this is not possible at all. 
because the side walls are parallel and they are narrow. So that's why no rotation, no rotation possible in anthropoid. But the baby will still deliver. It is occipital posterior. It delivers with the occiput posterior. So the occiput is posterior. What is anterior? The face is anterior. If the head is coming out occipital posterior, the face will be looking at the symphysis pubis. So yes, delivery will happen, but delivery by face to pubis. Face to pubis in a case of occipital posterior. All right, let's see what you guys are writing. Gynecoid, anthropoid, yes, diameter transfers. Okay, guys, I think you got most of it correct. Wait and watch. Caesarean section, nahi yaar, Shipra. Caesarean section, nahi karte hain. Occipital posterior, deliver kar jata hai. It does deliver. All right, so I've told you rotation is not possible in anthropoid. But yes, in anthropoid also delivery is possible. Just that the head stays occipital posterior. In a case of gynecoid, Occipital posterior, I told you, see, rotation is possible. I told you here, occipital posterior becomes occipital anterior and delivery is possible. So, yes, occipital posterior, wait and watch. It will definitely deliver. Just that in occipital uh, posterior in uh, anthropoid, it delivers as phase 2 pubis. Chalo. So, I guess we've got this one. Now, guys, which semen parameter should be normal for performing this procedure? We have, we are trying to show you one oocyte. This is the egg here and this is the needle which is holding a sperm here. So what is the procedure we are trying to do? We are trying to do the intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So when I am trying to do the intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which parameter of the sperm should be normal? So yes, it is that same question which I have asked you in a different way. See here, I'm doing an ICSI, this is my lab and we are doing an ICSI here. So you see this, we are putting the sperm, see that bright spot here, see this bright spot, it's gone away now. So that is the sperm. Huh? So yes, if I show this to you again, see here, there is this sperm here, see the sperm has come here. So this sperm, we are putting the needle directly into the ooplasm, the cytoplasm. And we now aspirate the cytoplasm to activate the egg and then we put the sperm inside. So which parameter should be good if I want to do ICSI? Yes, which parameter should be good? So yes, which is the single best parameter? Now you know why we say morphology. If the morphology is good, even if it is non-motile sperm, it's just the morphology is good. I can take one normal sperm of a man, even if he has just one morphologically normal sperm, and I can put into the egg of his wife, and I can give him his own biological child. That's why even if one sperm morphologically is normal, hmm? even if it is non-motile, count is very low. Whatever sperm is there is not motile, but morphologically normal and live sperm, I can go ahead and do the ICSI. So yes, single best parameter morphology. So yes, you all got it correct. Polar body at 12 o'clock. Yes, Sachin, you remember what I told you in the classes. Yes, keep the polar body always here. Because when you inject the sperm in this patient, see when you inject the sperm with the needle, the sperm will fall like this. This red color sperm will fall here. Because the area here near the polar body has the genetic material, okay, the mitotic spindle is there. So don't inject it there, don't spoil the mitotic spindle. Always keep the polar body at 12 o'clock, that's a good thing. A lot of people try to keep it at 6 o'clock and keep the, there are some people like that also. But then we'll do this. Good, so we got this one correct. Now, there are four, oh God, uh, everything has become red. Oh my God. So yes, I should have reviewed the slide. Let me tell you, there is a red knot there. I'll make a blue ligature here. Wait, I'll make it more clearer. Blue ligature here. I will make a black ligature here. Okay. And I'll make a red is there, blue, okay, a yellow. I'll put a yellow ligature here okay a yellow ligature here okay i've put four ligatures i think you can see all the four ligatures 
There are four ligatures, red, blue, black and yellow. So this patient, this patient has PPH. A patient is having PPH. It is so bad that none of my methods are working. I've even done uh, Beelin suture. I've done uh, tamponade by Bakri balloon. Now, I have done the Beelin, still the bleeding is not stopping. So I think I must start ligating the blood vessels. So first I ligate the uterine artery, then I ligate the ovarian artery. But if that doesn't work, I go and do the internal iliac artery ligation. So when I'm doing the internal iliac artery ligation, which part of the internal iliac artery I'm going to ligate? Red, blue, black or yellow. Which ligature is the best ligature here? Please tell me the color. Answer in color code. Yes. Kanupriya is saying put a snug ligature. Don't put a very tight ligature. That much is correct. I'll take a water break. You guys tell me which ligature is the correct one here. Okay. The blue, the black, the yellow or the red. Where do I put the ligature? The interiliac has become a big question, all the exams. Excuse me, guys. Red. Red is wrong, guys. Red is wrong. You're like it in the internal iliac artery. No, that is wrong. Red is wrong. So, yes, some of you are writing blue already. So, please, let us see. The internal iliac artery has got an anterior division which has all the major branches and the posterior division which has only three branches. So I remember it as short gills like some of you have already written. This is my acronym where I say short gills. Fishes have gills, so short gills. Superior gluteal iliolumbar lumbar lateral sacral. The easy question which came in the last INICT, which of the following is a posterior division branch? Superior gluteal was the choice. Now, Two things you have to know in internal iliac artery ligation. What is the principle? First of all, we are not ligating the artery here. No, we are not doing that. We are ligating only the ligate only anterior division. And it's a comfortable ligature to stop the flow? No. Comfortable ligature to reduce the flow. We put the ligature to reduce flow. So sluggish flow promotes thrombosis, sorry, sluggish flow, reduced flow will promote, I'll write here, promote thrombosis. So that's why, that's why we do, that's why we do a reduction of flow. We don't stop the flow. We just reduce the flow in the internal um, iliac artery the anti-division, you know that is the one which is going to give us the branch known as the uterine artery and the uterine artery which is supplying blood to the plasmal base, that base is bleeding. So we reduce the flow, see that we are reducing the flow. When we reduce the flow, the flow to the uterine bed is sluggish. When the flow to the uterine bed is sluggish, that promotes thrombosis there and that will stop the bleeding. So hello, we are not stopping the flow, we are only reducing the flow, number one. Number two, we are ligating the anti-division only. Okay? So these are two things which you should know. So yes, the blue ligature is the correct one. Yes, you got it. Great. Okay, let us see. What is this instrument which we are showing you here? Yes, I think this is a good picture. It is uh, very clear. And your this is coming from, my, uh, from the studio. And I'm sure you can make out on your YouTube also. Where is that? Let me see. It is coming on my phone properly. Oh yes, fairly clear. So I'm sure you can tell me what is this instrument. It is used in obstetrics. Chalo, that much I can tell you. All right, everybody knows that. Not bad. The three, four answers which have come. Green army Taj. Green army Taj. Yes, the green army Taj is the instrument here. Green army Taj. So it is the instrument which is used for reducing the bleeding and holding the angles of the uterine incision. So when I make a uterine incision to deliver a baby, so this incision through which I take out the baby, the sides 
will have the uterine arteries here and they may bleed so what do i do i put the green armitage here the green armitage is here so the angles of the uterus even if the uterine is not bleeding okay i hold the uterine angles it's not that the uterine artery bleeds every time i do a season please that is going to be a lot of hemorrhage so please uterine artery is rarely bleeding even if it is not bleeding what do i do i put my incision when i put and take the baby out the angles of the incision are held by the green armitage forceps and that green armitage is going to stop the bleeding so yes most of you those who have worked as interns you would have uh, realized that uh, this instrument was not used most of the time most of the time they're using the alice forceps which is also correct it's not a wrong instrument to use but the instrument meant for that is this flat forceps with this uh, transfer serrations which gives a very good hemostasis good so this is how we put this here. I, I don't know whether the video is a little uh, shrunk here somehow. So I'm just trying to show you the, this is the Alice forceps which I've put on the uh, anterior in the part of the uterine incision. But see now, now this, this is the green armitage being applied. This is the green armitage at the angle. So this is where the green armitage is implied, applied. And um, of course, there's another instrument which you can see here. Yes, can you, can you tell me what is this instrument here? Of course, this is coming later in the discussions also. This is the intern's best friend. You know, all of you, those who have done the internship, uh, this is this was your best friend when you were doing the ops posting. Yes, you were. You, this instrument was not in your hand. You, you were in the hands of this instrument. This became the extension of your hand. The doyens. Yes, that is the doyens retractor. Best friend of interns. Doyens retractor, which is very helpful. See. What a good service you guys do. You make sure that we can enter the abdomen and incise the lower segment. When I incise the lower segment and it bleeds, I can do the suturing because you are using this doyens instrument so well to retract the lower part of the incision and the blood away from this incision. So doyens is very important because I must reach the lower segment. So hello, why do you want to reach the lower segment with so much of difficulty? Why can't you just cut in the upper segment here, the uterus? I'm not saying the abdomen, okay? I'm talking about the uterine upper segment and the uterine lower segment. Why do so much of a uh, headache, uh, so much of a physical torture give to the interns that hold, pull, niche push karo. And if the intern is a little lazy, Aray, yaar, you've not eaten food, pull down, nicely pull down. We keep, uh, 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 you know, telling you guys to go and putting some uh, force into it. Why? Why so much of discomfort, so much of... Uh, you know effort to go ahead and do a lower segment why not just do a upper segment yes let's see let's see let's see what you guys are answering so dark knight has uh, more or less given the answer that yes i do the lower segment because this time i did a scissoring for whatever reason at least next time if this patient goes into labor i can do a normal delivery because all of us know that the upper segment yes when the baby is delivering the upper segment this segment contracts and the lower segment retracts so suppose this pregnancy i've done a lower segment cesarean here when i've done a lower segment cesarean here next time if she goes into labor, the upper segment will contract and the lower segment will retract. So the place where you give the cesarean, the lower segment, the LSCS, this area will be taking part in a retraction. Not many of you know that. And a uh, lot many people, if you ask why are you are doing a lower segment cesarean, sometimes uh, they, 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 they say because it is done, it is done lower segment. Of course, what we have in our mind, we have that next time when the woman goes into labor, at least we have given a lower segment the chance of rupture next time is very less yes trial of labor yes trial of labor after cesarean section the chance of rupture is 0.5 to 2 percent only trial of labor after cesarean if you give tolac some people call it vaginal birth after cesarean so vaginal birth after cesarean or trial of labor after cesarean Chance of rupture for a LSCS is 0.52%. Of course, if it's a classical cesarean section, then it is 8 to 10%. So that's why I don't do a trial of labor in a classical cesarean. Of course, I don't give a classical cesarean. Sometimes we have to give, but then we avoid. 
All right, so what do you guys say? To prevent cosmetic reason? No, yaar, Nikhil. Cosmetic nahi hai. No, Mohammed Zayed. No, no, not at all. We are not talking about... Look, guys, when we're talking about uterine incision, see here, see here, guys. See here, this is the uterine incision we are talking. Abdominal incision, okay? If you're really interested, let me tell you. The abdominal incision, here is the umbilicus, here is the chest of the woman and I'm about to make incision. So abdominal incision is vertical or it is transverse. So when it is a vertical incision, it will be seen. But if it is a transverse incision like this and one day the lady goes to the beach, then her lower part of the bikini will cover this incision so nicely. Oh God. Oh, I'm coming in the way of the bikini, I think. So, oh God, I drew it all here. So, what I'm trying to say here, see, there is the incision here. There is the incision, the lower segment incision. So, if this lady wears a bikini, then this incision will be nicely covered, all right? So, that's why we say, give a lower abdominal incision on the abdomen. Fan and steel, we call it. It's the abdominal incision. So whatever incisions we're talking, see, I've opened the abdomen. I'm trying to show you the abdominal incision and the uterine incision. So abdominal incision is transverse because it is cosmetically nice because if she wears a garment which is a little revealing, so then it'll be hidden by this lower part of her bikini. But if she has to talk about the uterine incision. That is, you open the abdomen, then get into the uterus. Then I give a lower segment incision. Lower segment incision given because it bleeds less, it heals well. And next time you can give a trial of normal vagina delivery. So yes, guys, please rewind and listen to this part of the equation once more. I'm talking about the lower segment. Then I mean the uterine incision, not the abdominal incision. All right? Chalo. I hope, good, good. Somebody answered wrong. So we can... Um, uh, get this out okay so what about urfi javed uh, i hope uh, 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 i wish i, I knew oh, uh, the reference here is that a is that a person who is uh, uh, i'm sorry some answer from urfi javed okay fine let's move on i wish i knew uh, vishal you can tell me more about the question we'll come to that later then let's move on so what is this instrument uh, which is being used here the next instrument we use here is um, Alice forceps. See, Alice forceps, I hope you can see that well. The Alice forceps has this teeth, you know, it has this gripping teeth on the tip of the instrument. So if I'm using tough tissues, like if I'm trying to hold uh, the rectus sheath, I use the Alice. Don't use it for holding bubble. You'll injure the bubble. Don't use it for holding on the skin also. Some of you keep testing the skin for anesthesia by this. It has got four teeth and this is a wrong thing to do. If you want to check for a block of anesthesia, use a thumb forceps. Okay. We don't use this. So, uh, dissection forceps also we call it or we call the thumb forceps. Please don't use this for testing for block. So, this is the Alice forceps and Alice forceps is classically used for the rectus sheath. We can also use it for holding the angles of the uterus in a case of a cesarean section, but not the ideal instrument. Okay, the Alice forceps is here. Now, this is your instrument which you is your best friend. I keep saying this is the Doyne's instrument. Okay, you know this very well and it is put in the lower uh, part of the abdominal incision to pull the incision down and also to pull the bladder away from the bladder away from the so what happens? I mean, if you really want to understand, uh, let's see if I can quickly show that to you. This is the baby in the uterus. This is the vagina. And this is the bladder here. And this is the anteriabdominal wall. This is the posterior wall. So when you want to do a lower segment cesarean, it's here, lower segment. So if I cut the abdomen here, if I cut the abdomen here and I have to do the lower segment incision here, can you see the bladder is coming in the way? So yes, when I open the abdomen, see I have opened the abdomen now. I have opened the abdomen, I get in and the bladder is in the way. So what do I do? I retract the bladder down. 
so when this bladder is retracted down see that that bladder is held in place i will dissect it down now i will hold in place this bladder is held in place by my retractor this is the work of this doins retractor in addition to holding the uh, lower edge of the abdominal incision it also holds the bladder down and thanks to interns and the first cpgs who assist us so many cesareans we are able to do it only if you can retract the bladder down so hello if the bladder is badly stuck if the bladder is badly stuck here like in a case of bladder fibrosis bladder fibrosis or lower segment tumors for example like a fibroid uterus or post mortem mother just now died and you doing a cesarean for saving the baby who may be still alive so these are the indications of a classical cesarean section so so much discussion we had guys once again when i'm talking lower segment and classical cesarean we are talking about the uterine incision how i do the lower segment incision the abdomen is cut whichever way vertical or transverse abdomen incision is cosmetic correct you cut the abdomen and you retract the lower part of the abdomen by your doins and when i reflect the bladder that is also held by the same so you can see in this picture two things are retracted one is the lower part of the incision and the bladder so that is held by the doins i can get into the uterus by the lower segment but if the bladder is stuck here if this bladder is stuck here by adhesions very bad adhesions are here then i can't push the bladder down so i'll have to cut in the upper segment so lower segment tumors and uh, bladder fibrosis post mortem cesarean section that means if the mother just died because of some reason and now you are in a hurry to take out the baby so doing a classical is actually faster and easier but next time i can't give her a normal delivery that's why i don't do classical but this mother is died so if she's died because of whatever misfortune and the baby is still living i can just cut the abdomen and cut the uterus in a classical and take the baby out okay chalo let's move on and see uh, another question doins doins forceps okay um, cannot do lscs have to perform classical yes uh, bladder should be empty yeah bladder should be uh, we shall we empty the bladder before this because if the bladder is too big then it will come all over the lower segment so yes we always tell the woman to empty the bladder then only she does the cesarean sometimes women are in advanced labor and they cannot go to the loo and we put a catheter sometimes before a lot of people routinely put catheters but routine catheterization if you read any good book in surgery books routine catheterization is only going to cause routine urinary tract infections so don't make it a habit if you are becoming a surgeon vishal remember catheterization only when absolutely required routine surgeries planned surgeries if you can prevent catheterization you will prevent a lot of uti in your patients so write to me in the email whichever i give you at the end of this discussions and i'll tell you why catheterization is done only when absolutely essential my patients who had hysterectomies who had cesareans whatever surgeries they don't have catheters immediately after the post op even if i put during the surgery the catheter is out yes we make a women walk after surgery early ambulation is the best for a patient after any major surgery they walk they go to the bathroom and they pass urine there catheters you will understand this as you become surgeons you general surgeons will teach us gynecologists the importance of bladders all right chalo let's move on so um, yes what did i want to tell you here this is what i want to tell you about the doins retractor see out of so much of uh, dissection see and so much of uh, effort see we are trying to push the bladder down and the uterus down i mean the uh, lower abdomen incision down and then only you reach the uterus okay so before that now divers retractor that i've given the picture because we were talking about doins so i thought i'll give the name already divers retractor is the one which is used for doing uh, you know uh, surgery in the depth of the pelvis so when i'm doing deep pelvic surgeries this divers retractor is used and this is the landens this is the landens retractor landens retractor this is is a right angle vaginal wall retractor 
So I don't know whether you interns had the chance of using this retractor because mostly the uh, postgraduates are the ones who are assisting us for a vaginal hysterectomy or some difficult vaginal procedures. So we actually call it uh, for our uh, day to day sister right angle then a right angle like that we call. So this is the right angle retractor but it is not the name right angle is not the name it's just that the blade is at a right angle so we call this in the, the OT. Maybe the interns would have heard the right angle retractor. But this is the Landon's vaginal wall retractor. We use uh, this to retract the vaginal walls. You know, we do vaginal hysterectomies. Sometimes the uterus is quite big and um, the interns or the first APGs mostly, first APGs and the, the third APGs or the SRs, they assist the consultants. So interns um, assisting vaginals, I have not seen. I did not assist. Even uh, in my internship, I assisted a lot of cesareans and a lot of hysterectomies, but vaginal hysterectomies become a little tough. Abdominal hysterectomies you can assist because you're mostly holding a retractor. The Divas retractor comes in your hand that time because you're operating in the depth of the pelvis when you're doing a hysterectomy. But this Landon's retractor, I don't know whether you've had the chance of, you must have seen it, I'm sure. Now, what is this procedure being done or already being done on the uterus? There's a Don's retractor again. The uterus is outside. My finger is trying to show you something. My fingers, glove fingers are there. And we are trying to show you something there. What are these sutures kind of things on the uterus? I'm not giving you any more hints. Let's see. I think any, most of you would have got it. How to differentiate from Morris from Landon's? Little difficult. I, I should have shown the pictures. B. Lynch. Yes. B. Lynch. Yes. Very good. Good evening. Hi, guys. Yes, that is the B-Lynch hemostatic suture. I'm happy that most of you know that. The B-Lynch hemostatic suture is the one which is applied like this. You will go through the lower part of the uterus and uh, uh, for the incision, go to the back and come back. So this incision, you take it so tight that it will not compress. Can you see it is not compress the uterine muscle. So what happens, you're trying to do uterine massage to stop the bleeding after PPH and your uterine massage, moment you take your hand out from the vagina and from the abdomen, bimanual massaging you're doing, gently you should do, uterine massage is to be done. And when you're doing the uterine massage, moment you take your hand off, she bleeds again. Again you do massage, in spite of doing for another 15 minutes, you take your hand off, she bleeds again. So this muscle is really, really tonic and she's got electrolyte imbalance because she was in a prolonged labor. What is the reason uterus is not contracting? Now, she's going to bleed to her death. So, you open the abdomen, take the uterus out of the abdomen and put this big tight suture. It's using, it's using absorbable sutures, mostly vicryl. One vicryl we use and you can use the thick vicryl to just pin down the uterus with your suture. So, it is physically contracting this uterus and the bleeding will stop. So, that is the b lynch hemostatic suture. All right, I'm sure all of you got that correct. Now, what is this um, swelling on the external genitalia? I'll just say that. Yes, what is this swelling here? Condyloma acuminata, vulval hematoma, vulval cancer or a Bartholin cyst? Yes, tell me. Okay. Yes, what are you guys saying? How many got it? Bartholin. Okay, so see the location guys. This is how we trouble you people. See the location. So Bartholin, if you see the vaginal opening, the Bartholin gland is here. Bartholin gland. So if you want to say Bartholin cyst, the swelling will be somewhat here. It will be involving the labia majora and the minora and the minora's inside part will be also swollen because the Bartholin gland opens in the vagina. It's called the greater vestibular glands. So vestibule, the vaginal opening, okay, the opening passage, vestibule, greater vestibular gland, it opens in the vagina. This swelling, is it in the vagina or is it on the side of the vagina in the vulva? This is the vulval swelling. Yes, this is not a Bartholin cyst. All right. This is a little difficult one for you guys. I know maybe I should have given you a better picture, but this is not a Bartholin abscess. This is a vulval hematoma. Okay, guys, this is a vulval hematoma. And please remember 
this vulval hematoma is so big after a case of uh, delivery this uh, sometimes there's a lot of blood inside so bathroom cysts will be somewhat little inside now see the next picture now can you see the swelling this swelling is like this this is a bartholin cyst and this can get infected and become a bartholin's abscess the treatment of bartholin's abscess is mar mar supplyization okay it is a mar supplyization all right All right, um, maybe uh, there was uh, some uh, better picture here. I should have shown you of the vulval hematoma. All right, so let us just see this. Maybe the picture is not so good and maybe it was answered as bathroom abscess, somebody is saying. But yes, you must see the labia here. You see the labia, then you'll understand. This is a typical vulval hematoma. Bathroom abscess, okay, the bathroom abscess is here. Bartholin abscess in the location I've shown you. Now look at this one. Look at this one here. This is the vulval ulcer. This is the vulval ulcer. All right. Okay. So I agree. Maybe uh, Dr. Deepak is saying, sir, maybe that was. Okay. So Bartholin's abscess. Bartholin's abscess will be involving. See, in the exam, the pictures will be very clear. Exam, the pictures will be very clear. So if you are feeling that uh, uh, there is some error here, don't worry about that. You will see a very nice bathroom. It will be somewhat like this, the one I have shown you here. Okay, so I will show you that again. You can see this is exactly the bathroom glands will open here somewhere. The bathroom gland will open here somewhere. Now it has become swollen. So this is a bathroom cyst. Of course, this is a bathroom cyst. If it gets infected, it is known as a bathroom abscess. All right, guys, now this is the triple layer endometrium of a normal uterus. In this triple layer of endometrium, look here. See this. There is the basal endometrium which is proliferating here. Basal endometrium proliferating here. This is the central cavity of the uterus which does not have anything. So, this is what is the triple layer endometrium. Triple layer. Okay. And can you see the difference? You can see the endometrium nicely and you can see the myometrium and endometrium difference. See, this is the myometrium, the myometrium, this is the endometrium. So, endometrial, myometrial distinction is normal. I'm just telling you a normal uterus. So, this on the ultrasound is a normal uterus. Now, you tell me what is happening here. This is also a uterus. First of all, it's a huge uterus. Okay, you can see 69.6 .6 plus uh, 19, that's almost like, um, yeah, it's an 88 centimeter long uterus. Generally, the uterus is 7 centimeters long or 8 centimeters. This is 88, 90 uh, millimeters long, not centimeters, 90 millimeters long. That is 9 centimeters. And the transverse is 6.7. Forget that. Can you see the endometrium and the myometrium very clearly? Different, are you able to make out? See here, it is so easily made out here. Once more, I'll show you here. See this uterus where the myometrium and the endometrium. See the distinction is so good. Can you see the distinction here? No, it is not. Can you see this vaguely, roughly it is the endometrium and the junctional zone. Can you make out this junctional zone? This junctional zone is more than 12 millimeters. I'm not able to show you the size of the junction zone here, but junctional zone is if it is more than 12 millimeters, then this myometrial endometrial distinction is lost. Junction zone is more than 12 millimeters. So this is where we say a uniform enlarged uterus. Junction zone is more than 12 millimeters and the myometrial endometrial distinction is lost. So, yes, what is this? This is adenomyosis. Everyone is saying adenomyosis. Yes, this is adenomyosis. All right, very good. Quite a few of you got this correct and I'm happy for that. So, this is adenomyosis. Let's move on and see. Next one. This is the picture of adenomyosis. Can you see this? Here. This adenomyosis, you can, why are you saying adenomyosis? You cannot make out the endometrium at all. The endometrium is there somewhere. 
So this is, you know, I showed this picture in one of the classes and I said, how do you know, how, what are the features of this? How do you know this is adenomyosis? Tell me the features of adenomyosis. I was asking the class. That boy said, sir, tell me, how do you know that this is a uterus? Very good question. Actually, if you look at this, how do you think this is a uterus? I had to tell him that this is a uterus because I'm doing the scan and I know it is a uterus of my patient. That's the only way I could counter, counteract that guy. So yes, so I could not counter him much because the liver also looks like this in uh, the ultrasound most of the times and the spleen also may look like this at some part. So yes, this is a uterus because I'm telling you it's a uterus. Now tell me, this uterus, is it a normal uterus or adenomyosis? So big uterus with uh, loss of endometrial myometrial distinction. So I've written all that. Heteroechoic deposits in the myometrium. This heteroechoic, see black and white dark deposits. Uh, recently, around two hours back, some student told me that this is also called the salt and paper look. Yes, it is also called the salt and paper look by the radiologist. Okay. And this uh, heteroechoic deposits, lakes of myometrial blood. Yes, you'll see these lakes. These lakes of myometrial blood. There'll be some blood in the uterine muscle of the endometrium which has come in, which is actually the adenomyosis. And junction zone, which is normally around 5 to 8 millimeters, has become more than 12 millimeters in a case of adenomyosis. So enough about adenomyosis. Now, I'm showing you the Y chromosome. Yes, this is one of my favorite uh, pictures, the Y chromosome. And the uh, we have the short arm and the long arm. The long arm has the azoospermia factors. So when the Y chromosome is present, okay, when the Y chromosome is present, but the Y chromosome grossly looks normal, if there are micro deletions, which you cannot make out, they are micro deletions. If they are micro deletions in the Y chromosome, and these micro, uh, micro deletions in the long arm can cause azoospermia. So azoospermia factors are present on the long arm. The micro deletions are present on the long arm. There's azoospermia if azoospermia B and the azoospermia C, three zones. Now, it is present on the long arm. It is a micro deletion. Grossly, you can see the Y chromosome. Micro deletion, you have special techniques. So, which one of these is the most common micro deletion? This MCQ has come in your NEET exam. Yes, which one of this is the most common micro deletion? And next one, which one of this is the most severe micro deletion? Come, let's see if you guys are answering any one of these properly. Which one of these is most common? Let's see. Yes, which one is it? Adenomyosis. Oh, it's still with adenomyosis. Micro deletion. Okay, fine. Most of you got it correct. Now, micro deletion. Yes, please answer the question. Water break. Dark Knight is saying B. You mean to say azoospermia factor B? A, B, C. So yes, uh, it's a little difficult one, I know. And I'll just quickly tell you the answers here. So please keep this picture handy for you guys. On the long arm of the Y chromosome, the most common, most common micro deletion is the distal, the azoospermia factor C. Azoospermia factor B, azoospermia factor B, that is the one which is the most severe. So mildest and the most common is azoospermia factor C and the most severe is the azoospermia factor B. Now how do you make out these micro deletions? The micro deletion are made out by the multiplex multiplex polymerase chain reaction method multiplex pcr the multiplex pcr is the method by which we do this micro deletion assessment all right that's what a tough one i i hope you guys will remember it now okay chalo theek hai okay see most severe is azoospermia b not the c all right once more oshin sony all right chalo aage badhte hain Name the instrument in this procedure. Now, that's an easy one. This is a curette. Now, what is the name of this curette? Yes. What is the name of this curette? We are doing a curettage. 
how do you know the, by the way by the time you tell me the name how do you know the kirtaj is complete okay grating sound if you get grating sound and you see bubbling of blood look you are doing a curate okay you are in the uterus and you are going on doing a curatage like this like this like this so with your experience you know that there is enough endometrium there and the curate is complete but sometimes you go on scraping and you don't know when to stop if you go on scraping too much you are going to cause Eshman syndrome overzealous curatage so how do you know it is complete the uterine cavity is now empty and you are going on scraping so you are scraping on the muscle moment you get grating sound stop that is indication stop and if you are grating in an empty uterus, there is no endometrium left, you are scraping on an empty uterus. So there will be some blood inside and you are scraping an empty uterus. So air and blood will come out as bubbles. So you get two things, grating sound and bubbling of blood, stop the curate. That is indication. You still go on, you want to go on doing the scraping, then you are going to cause a Eshman syndrome. So yes, meanwhile, what is the name of this instrument? Curator. <laughs> Oh God, that's a nice one, uh, Bhavnesh Chavan. Uh, my class, I crack the jokes. All right, Bhavnesh, you took away a good one, curator. <laughs> okay, I'll have to compose myself. So guys, please. So the curate here is known as the Sims curate. Okay, we also have the Blake's curate. My favorite one is Blake's. But yes, Sims curate is the one which is generally asked of you people in the exam. So yes, these are the types of the curates, the Sims curate, the big ones, small ones. I use the biggest curate because I need that when I do a curate, I should get a good chunk easily and fast. So I like a big curate, but yes, for big curate, you need the service to be dilated more. So that's a personal favorite. I like a big diameter curate and I do a lot of endometrial biopsies because I deal in infertility so much. So I love to do the curates myself and my PGs get a little upset. So curatage bhi bar aap khud karte ho. Because I like to do curatage. You know, the gynecologist loves to do some things like this. Anyway, let's uh, move on and see. We've done about the curate and let's move and see. Um, next question. And uh, this is the curate again. This is the, yes, this is the curate again. Right. So, uh, if I see, if I tell you this instrument, what is the procedure being done in this uterus? This is a hysteroscope. That is the hint. I am doing some placement here. I can show you that something has already been placed here. Something has already been placed here. So, yes. Uh, this has come in your exam, uh, INICD guys. If it is in Williams, it's your MCQ. As simple as that. Uh, like it or not. This is the Assure coil. Yes, I'm sure some of you already wrote the answer. Assure. No, not copper tea, Neha Das. HSG bhi nahi hai. Instrument dal rahe Oh, you did get it wrong, some of you. Dr. H, very nice. Contraception click kar rahe Very good. A lot of... <laughs> oh, wow. Good, I put this. INICT guys, please remember, this is a hysteroscope and HSG is not done with a hysteroscope, please. HSG is, done, HSG is coming in the text, uh, I mean in the group of questions uh, later on. So please, HSG is done using a, using a leech cannula. This is a hysteroscope I told you. So with the hysteroscope, I am putting an instrument and I showed you, I have already put this instrument. So that is the Assure coil. Assure coil is made up of nitinol. Nitinol is a nickel and titanium alloy. Nickel, nitinol, okay, nitinol, nickel titanium alloy. So when I'm using the nickel titanium alloy, this causes fibrosis of the tube. Fibrosis in three months. So three months may when it causes fibrosis, then only the woman gets to be known sterile. So this is a contraception. Yes, this is a method of sterilizing a woman by causing fibrosis of the tube. Generally, hum log kya karte hai? we just ligate the tube. Yes, all of you know that. But now this is a sophisticated method by which hysteroscopically you can put two um, coils inside the tube. They induce fibrosis over three months. Of course, to check if the tubes are blocked or not after three months. Three months later. Yes, that is correct. Three months later, do a hysterosalpingography to know whether the tube is open still or it is indeed blocked. So, hy hysteroscopic placement of a 
coil, Escher coil is done. It's a little tedious process. First, you do the hysteroscopy to insert, and then after three months again, you do hysterosalpingography to confirm that it is blocked. And most people won't come for this procedure in my country, at least I'm sure. It's very difficult to convince them for any contraception. Escher coil, I have not inserted Escher coil. I don't know if uh, some people have done in uh, some trials were done in some hospitals where the coils were sent across. But the very fact that people are not going to listen for any contraception advice, forget even tubectomies are so difficult for us to convince these people. That's why what happens, they, they deliver two babies and when they're delivering the third baby, we catch them. On the day of delivery, we catch them and tell them tomorrow morning I'm doing your tubectomy, don't go home. So we catch them like that. So second and third baby late after that, we do a tubectomy, which is known as pure peril tubal ligation or pure peril ligation. That is what is commonly done. Assure coil, like I said, I do so much of hysteroscopies. I have not yet put the Assure coil uh, because I think uh, nobody is going to come so much for a sterilization procedure. Yes, I've only taught it because it came in the NEET exam and uh, it is there in Williams. So if it is there in Williams, it can be a question. Uh, difficult to read Williams as a book, but yes, at least the questions which have come, that part you can read. Fine. What type of, this is the classification of the fibroids and those who were getting a little confused, this is what is that? FIGO classification of fibroids and you should know that uh, which type of fibroid you can take out laparoscopically, which you can take out hysteroscopically. That is why this picture is given. Name the fibroids which can be taken out laparoscope. Laparoscope is put like this. So yes, virtually all type of fibroids, some maverick surgeons, you know, some of us who've been doing so much of uh, work on um, uh, laparoscopic myomectomies, we can take out even the slightly difficult ones. But we should know that what is safely done, not taking many risks. So safely, which one you can take out? So the seven, see this sub, uh, serous pedunculated, the pedunculate is missing here actually, seven, six, and maybe a 5 can be easily done if I am doing laparoscopic myomectomy. Laparoscopic myomectomy. This was a question for INICT and also for the MCA exam sometimes back. Which one of these you can do hysteroscopically? Hysteroscopic myomectomy. Type 0, type 1, maybe type 2. Okay? Hysteroscopic myomectomy. All right? I think you guys got it correct. Um, no, I told you that yes, uh, subserous fibroid type 6, type 7, yeah, peduncle can be missing. Yes, subserous fibroids type 6 and type 7 might be a very short peduncle you might not see. Still, you can call it type 7, it's all right. That is a good question somebody asked. The picture was there in exam? Yes, so many times. What is this clip? I'm talking about uh, tubectomy again and what is this clip? Yes. So this is a tooth clip. Sometimes there are no teeth in it like this. So these are the clips and then there is the ring. Ring is somewhere else I think in this uh, exam. So in this image based session. So this is known as the Hulka clip. It has teeth. Hulka clip has its tooth. It's a tooth uh, clip. And Hulka, you know, how I remember between two teeth, you can see a U kind of a thing. I'm sure you will remember otherwise, but between the teeth, you see a U, Hulka. I mean, even if you don't like it, just remember it. Then, that is Hulka clip. This is a clip. And this is the Filsche clip. Filsche clip. This is not the ring, obviously. The ring is something like this. And ring is known as the fellope ring. That will come later. These are the instruments which are used for clipping the tube in tubectomy. Mostly laparoscopic tubectomies we do with the clip or the ring. So these clips, Filsche clip and the Hulka clip, Filsche clip and the Hulka clip are the best re-anastomosis. Yes, best re-anastomosis whenever I need to do for a patient. Okay, if uh, sometimes what happens... Uh, a woman might, uh, you know, have a divorce and the husband takes away the, uh, the children. So she wants to remarry and have uh, more children. So that's why we can have to, we may, we may have to do a re -anastomosis. So that is what is a, a best re by the laparoscopic clips. You can put clips even otherwise open also you can put clips. But mostly we put them laparoscopically. All right. So yes, if you're asking me some doubts here, the picture was there in the exam. Yeah, fine. Okay. Hulka and the, so. Now, 
this came in the neat exam last year and they asked that in these in these uh, diagrams of the hymen what is the name of this one the last one so last one is a septate one easy one so tell me what is the name of the second one okay i'll mark it in uh, uh, let's say red for you so that you know what is this last one yes second last one rather what type of hymen is this the one which came in exam oh god i didn't write it properly septate this came in exam okay septate uh, hymen what is the one uh, which is second last yes anybody all right no it's not imperforate vishal vishal imperforate ye wala hai this is the imperforate it's totally blocked isn't it that's a imperforate hymen yes cribriform cribriform multiple fenestrations like your ethmoid plate is also called the cribriform plate is a multiple holes cribriform so cribriform hymen so this one is a micro perforate micro perforate and this one is a imperforate and this is a normal hymen of course this hymen is a little irregular it's not a regular hymen if you see this opening this is a little irregular in this picture so i'm sure that this is a woman who is sexually active it's not a, a virginal kind of hymen yes the second one is um, of course hymen can be torn because of uh, physical exercise also we know that so imperfect hymen is the one which uh, is usually a question but uh, this time they asked you a septate hymen the one which is there that was also simple it was not very difficult to answer what is this cannula this is the leech cannula which we use for a hysterosalpingography this is a easy one don't get uh, too upset by this thing this is the stillet which is there you know we want to clean this instrument there will be a lot of uh, blood there sometimes there a lot of some muck there some dye will be there so to clean this we have a stillet so that it is not blocked when i'm doing so this is uh, a stillet is inside this leech wilkinson leech wilkinson cannula all right yes most of you got it correct it is used for yes so this is the one yeah uh, somebody saying that some one of my best friend used foley's yes you can put a foley's in the uterus for uh, uh, putting a dye that can also be a method foley's is inserted in the uterus sometimes we inflate the foley's inflate it so much that it gives pressure on the uterine walls so look whoever was writing that look here if uh, that's a pen you can't see i think you can see now so if you put a foley's in the uterus and inflate the bulb so that bulb will inflate and inflate with say 50 ml 60 ml of saline some big foley's like a 16 gauge foley's you can put in a foley's into the uterus and distend the bulb that bulb will give tamponade tamponade to the uterine muscle so that will stop the bleeding sometimes okay so that also can be used so you uterus ke andar foley's kai bar but maybe you trying to tell me as a joke yet somebody inserted a uh, foley's in the uterus by mistake yeah that has happened many times uh you been told as in turn to go and catheterize a woman because she's going for a cesarean and rather than putting in the urethra you put it into the uterus you put it into vagina yes that has happened yes that has happened yes that has happened many times maybe you're telling me like a joke yeah fine so this is the histosalpingography you can see this is the leech cannula inside and i'm putting the dye what is this dye yes dye name of this dye tell me anybody what is the name of this dye yes i was asking in a class somewhere today tell me the name of this dye which i'm using it's a radiopaque dye this is a fluoroscopy which i'm doing anybody in the class who can tell me what dye is being used yes i'm sorry i think i missed this yeah here blue dye urographin methylene blue methylene blue is not radiopaque guys when i'm doing a laparoscopy when i'm doing a laparoscopy i'm doing a laparoscopy like this and i'm looking at the uterus and my assistant is sitting below and she pushes some dye that is methylene blue so i'm looking here and the dye comes out into the fallopian tube then i use the methylene blue this is a radiopaque procedure methylene blue is just uh, saline mixed with uh, methylene blue so <laughs> you are not going to see that in this you need a, a dye which is radiopaque yes <laughs> anybody in the class let's see urographin is a trade name barium sulfate 
<laughs> okay, good. I'm so sorry I laughed. Okay, please don't get angry with me. Who is that? Okay, two or three of you wrote, Vishal, don't, don't, Biswas, Apni Amar Bondu. Okay, please don't get, uh, you know, you, I'm allowed to laugh sometimes. Okay. <laughs> Chroma perturbation is a process, Dark Knight. Process of doing, putting a chrome into the tube. Chroma perturbation is a process. While doing a laparoscopy, you put in some dye, that is methylene blue. So we say laparoscopy, hysteroscopy and a chromotivation. All right, HSG dye, let's not waste time. Meglumine, meglumine diatrizoate. Urographin is a correct thing, it's a trade name. Urographin is a little short in supply. Trazograph is there nowadays. So trade name koi nahi aapse. Okay, it's a, of course an iodine based dye and meglumine diatrizoate. I hope I've got the spelling correct of the diatrizoate. Uh, I have uh, problems with my spellings all the time. Okay, ammonium sulfate. <laughs> okay, let's move on guys. Okay, what is this instrument which is being shown here? It's got a lock. Please don't miss the lock here. It's got a lock here. So this is the sponge holder all right this sponge holder has got many uses so when you get into surgery sponge holder or you get into gynae you'll understand the sponge holder which is used for holding the sponge and cleaning the site of surgery most of the time it is sponge holder and uh, it is used for inserting sponge into the uterus a big sponge if you want to give it packing of the uh, uterus or the packing of the vagina it can be used but mostly it is used for cleaning the abdomen while doing a surgery but yes, sometimes we don't have the green armitage, so I use this for the holding the angles. Sometimes I don't have a, a right instrument to hold the uterus, anterior wall, and lower wall, so I use this sponge holder. Sponge holder comes as a very handy instrument. Yes, sometimes uh, we are uh, in a abortion where things are so many and I'm tired of doing the abortion with the ovums. I use the sponge holder, but I won't say that because if you use a sponge holder, it has got a lock in when you push the sponge holder inside the uterus and you're doing a DNC for an MTP, you may sometimes, by mistake obviously, you may perforate, you go into the abdomen. And if you hold bowel with the sponge holder and lock this instrument, you will surely pull the bowel out of the uterus. So it's not a very good instrument to do an abortion with. Obviously, we should use the ovums. It doesn't have a lock. Ovums doesn't have a lock. Sponge holder has a lock. So sponge holder best you use is for... Um, inspection of the cervix while I'm doing a, a you know a episiotomy and the patient starts bleeding in spite of the uterus being contracted so inspection of the cervix I can use two three sponge holders to go in a uh, clockwise manner to see inspect the cervix I can use it for packing the uterus packing the vagina I can use it for cleaning they are the good uses of course I can use it for holding the uterus like I said okay sponge holder now this is the Babcox what is this instrument I'm telling you the answer for this one because I already uh, feel that uh, we had a lot of discussion on things. So Babcock here, Babcocks. Babcocks is best instrument for the tubectomy to hold the tube because it's got this protective cage. See, it has got this protective cage like this. So uh, organs with the lumen, like even for the bowel, I can use this Babcock. It will not hurt. So it, this, uh, you know, don't use a Alice forceps. The tube will get uh, injured and the bowel will get injured with an Alice. So we use this instrument, Babcock. It's got a protective cage and the tips are blunt, okay? They don't hurt when I use this. Now, what is this instrument? This I will wait. Okay, tell me. Yes, tell me what is this. Yes, come on. Let's see what you guys are saying. Yeah, that's the ovums. Yes, you got it. Correct. See, ovums doesn't have a lock. It's got the serrations here. See the tip. Ovums got the serrations. It's like this. It's got the serrations. So when you hold the fetal part and it gives a good grip on the tissue. So whatever fluids are there, you know, some blood is there in the fetal part which we are holding. So that will come out of the serration. So it gives a good grip on the uh, tissues which you're trying to pull out. So ovums is a good instrument to do a medical termination of pregnancy. Yes, MTP is not done only for live babies. Of course, it can be done for dead babies also. So you should, uh, some people have reservations about doing MTPs. I can understand some of you will become gynecologists and lot, not like to do MTPs. Yes, I'm not very fond of them myself. But yes, you should know your art. 
you should learn your gynecology and you should learn MTPs because many times you have to do for dead fetus, you have to do an MTP. Okay, so please do learn about this. Whatever is your reservations, it's your personal choice. But do learn the, when you're doing a post graduation, at least learn about MTPs. Now, greenish yellow discharge and microscopy reveals these motile organisms. Suddenly, these two things, two things about vaginitis are becoming hot shot again. So, what are these motile organisms which can be seen on a microscopy easily? Yes, these are the, oh, maybe I'll see one answer at least. Trichomoniasis. Thank you guys. Trichomonads. These are motile, these are motile, it's a motile uh, trophozytes, okay. It's a motile organism. So these are motile and they cause severe, they cause severe itching and they cause greenish yellow frothy discharge. So this is trachomoniasis, correct? Flagellate protozoa. It's a flagellate, flagellate protozoa. All right. So that's fine. I'm, I'm sure. What is the drug of choice? Drug of choice is metronidazole. And how you do the diagnosis? Microscopy revealing motile organisms. Now, creamy white discharge with fishy odor, clue cells on microscopy. Now, this clue cells suddenly, INICT exam, NEAT exam and the MCI exam, everybody is asking clue cells. So you see, just like in a pap smear, you see these uh, polygonal epithelial cells and these polygonal epithelial cells are... Uh, you know, embedded with bacteria here. So this is what is known as a clue cell. It gives us a clue that the patient is having these numerous bacteria which are embedding the epithelial cells of the vagina. So that is giving us a clue. So this is seen in bacterial vaginosis. Please, creamy white discharge, fishy odor, clue cells on microscopy and the alkaline pH. Okay, and the WIF test. WIF test. So, WIF test, clue cells, fishy odor, creamy discharge, alkaline pH. This is known as the AMSELS criteria. AMSELS criteria and more, three or more, yes. Three or more. Three or more out of these five is equal to diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis three or more is the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis yes amsels criteria three or more Chalo. which part yes this is a laparoscopic view of the pelvis and can you tell me which is the area in all of these organs which you can see which is the second most common area for endometriosis yes most common is ovary for endometriosis we know please mark the area which is second most common now you tell me oh kishore is very fast yes quite a few of you got it correct so endometriosis pouch of douglas is the second most common pouch of ductless this area pouch is the second most site second most site of a person having endometriosis of course remember there's something else i want to know about uh, tell you that uh, the 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 hypogastric plexus the hypogastric hypogastric plexus okay the hypogastric plexus that goes to this uterosacral ligament. These are the uterosacral ligaments. So sometimes there is so much of pain in a woman, so much of pain in a woman that it is not getting respite by any painkillers and she is severe endometriosis. So you can do resection of this uterosacral ligaments. You just cut them. So uterosacral nerve, you say, or you say the hypogastric plexus that is going through this uterosacral ligament. So just make a neck. And that will disrupt the uh, neuronal pass, uh, passage and it's going to give this woman relief and pain. So that is all, that's, a, that's the last thing when somebody has too much of pain, we can do this also. All right. So hypogastric plexus or the presacral nerve. Presacral nerve. Chali. Let's move on. Now these are the patterns of the umbilical 
artery doppler patterns of umbilical artery doppler which of this is showing imminent death a b or c a b or c which one of these three patterns is telling the baby is about to die a b or c yes we are very correct that when there is reversal diastolic flow reversal diastolic flow that is the last one reversal can you see this is the reversal here reversal diastolic flow so that is imminent death about to die imminent death okay now absent diastolic flow that is severe compromise severe compromise is the absent diastolic flow but imminent death is the reversal diastolic flow all right so good yes what is the most common what is the most common reason for this this defect to happen in a woman yes that is one of the patients which uh, around last year uh, when covid you know the the you know the third wave came and not many patients were coming of course the second wave and the first wave you know this came during that third wave this patient of course nothing to do with covid i'm sorry i'm just telling you when i saw this patient it's nothing to do with covid i hope you don't get that clue for this so this patient is having a clitoris which is looking very big so clitoromegaly so which enzyme deficiency yes this is congenital adrenal hyperplasia i did not ask you the diagnosis guys i asked you the enzyme deficiency for this yes i'm sure all of you know the enzyme deficient most commonly is the 21 hydroxylase and second most common is the 11 beta hydroxylase so we are talking about the enzyme deficiency and 21 hydroxylase deficiency is the most common cause of this clitromegaly this is clitromegaly okay and yes it looks like a small penis here it is so big this was a 19 year old girl who had this problem and she used to have this uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you know this uh, she say off and on erection and i was thinking maybe she's not able to express herself properly so i when i saw i could make out that yes any time of any sexual stimulation this will become a little uh, erect and this will look like a small penis in that person so yes of course this reduction had to be done uh, clitorectomy had to be done my plastic surgeon friends uh, are way better than us to do that it's a sophisticated procedure so of course we also do that but yes they did a very good job for this patient anyway most common cause of uh, this is 21 hydroxylase deficiency the second most common cause is the 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency okay so this is that picture i want all of you to have this picture and i'm sure that uh, those who have followed me in any forums almost every image base i give you this picture please you should know all these um, this, uh, uh, enzymes and all the uh, derivatives of the cholesterol breakdown in the adrenal gland. Right from the 2022 desmolase and the 17 hydroxylase and the 1720 desmolase, everything is important. Must remember that this pathway is for the androgens and this pathway is for the steroids. And when the uh, hypothalamus is stimulating the uh, pituitary by the corticotropin releasing hormone, it is telling the pituitary to release the ACTH which acts on the adrenal gland to, by releasing the cholesterol and this cholesterol is going to break down and make these. So cholesterol is the common uh, precursor for these androgens and for the steroids. So you must know this pathway properly. Anyway, I have given this. Uh, those who want to see this clearly once more, yeah. All right, let's move on and see. Yeah, these are those uh, fellow rings. Yes, I was telling you that fellow rings will come a little late. Fellow rings, these are used for. So when we make a loop of the tube, these fellow rings are placed on that like this. So what happens? You you don't say that these fellow rings can be pulled out of this tube. This tube will immediately get ischemic. But tomorrow it'll become dark and it'll slough off day after tomorrow. So this ring which is put on this tube, that tube is not just blocked, it is also going to become ischemic and slough off in some time. So this is how the uh, fellow ring is applied. And uh, what is this instrument now? The next instrument which I'm showing you. So I showed you the Babcock forceps. That uh, Babcock forceps is used for the purpose of uh, holding the tube while doing a tubectomy. Here I'm doing, here I'm doing a procedure where I'm 
holding the vas, vasectomy. So we have an instrument which is sharp instrument to uh, stab the scrotum and get inside and pull the vas out. That is a sharp uh, artery forceps like instrument, very, very sharp tip. But how do you stabilize this vas for, for doing the ligation? So this is what is known as the ring forceps. This is the ring forceps for the vasectomy. All right. No, this is not Babcock. Good mistake, Dr. Sandeep. Good. That's a good mistake. Sometimes you should do. So that's why I showed you the Babcock. Way back, I showed you the Babcock already. See the Babcock here somewhere I showed you. It has got this protective cage. Now, this does not have this protective cage. Okay. So that's why this is the ring forceps. I mean, of course, this is not going to harm, but it's a much smaller one for the vas. What is this instrument? Yes, it's got teeth on it. All right, please see. Try to see the tip. I, I think this is a little faint for you to see. Even then, if I if I show you with my fingers, see there, there's uh, there's this two things and then this one thing here. So if you see this, okay, there are two things and one thing entering this. It's like this. So the, the tip has teeth. And one side there are two teeth and one side there is one tooth. So this goes in. So this is a sharp instrument. See, this is a sharp instrument by which we can use to hold tough things, tough things like the rectus sheath. And this is also the instrument which can be used for getting into the uterus and bursting the back of membranes when I want to do artificial rupture of membranes. Yes, now you tell me what is the name of this instrument. Cockers, yes, very good. This is the cockers, okay? The cockers forceps for doing a artificial rupture of membranes and holding tough structures like the rectus sheath. Good. What is this assembly used for? Yes, this assembly is used for the pap smear. This is not the question. The pap smear is the process I'm going to do. What is the name of this jar? The name of this jar is the Coplin's jar. What is the media which is used for fixing the slide? That is 95% alcohol. Okay, so 95% alcohol in this Coplin's jar. And what is this instrument which is lying on this floor? What is this instrument? This is the Iyer spatula. So Iyer spatula is the instrument by which we take a smear, just rotate it once and plate it on the slide and it is dried immediately it is i mean i'm so sorry i'm so sorry it is fixed immediately without drying fixed immediately fixed immediately no drying please if you allow it to dry it'll get spoiled so it is fixed immediately what is the fixative agent use it is the 95 percent alcohol all right so that's the instrument which we are using shallow now, what is this? The same instrument. See, I don't know. The one in white is a little faint. Okay, this is a spatula here. Quite faint. In fact, this is the spatula here. Or we have a cyto brush or a cyto broom. What are these instruments used for? They are again used for the purpose of taking a pap smear. I'm taking a gynec uh, image based discussion. I'll be obviously talking about pap smear here. So, this is a brush or a broom to take a smear and now I don't plate it on a slide I wash this see I wash this specimen I've taken the specimen let's say with a side to brush and I take the specimen and wash it in this media in this box when I wash it this is a, a commercial product so I've given you the name of the company also here and uh, this is washed in media now that media is poured into a test tube and the test tube is centrifuge so we get all the cells on the bottom in the, of the sediment and those cells are used for smearing so this way whatever whatever you took from the smear of the cervix all the cells will go into your media and you'll not have loss of the specimen. The cells which you take from a pap smear, the cells you take with iron spatula or with a cyto brush and you wash it in the media and then centrifuge, cell loss is less. Sometimes what we do, most of the times what we do, we take a smear and we wipe it on a slide. So a lot of cells will not go on to this slide. So yes, 
liquid based cytology lbc liquid based cytology is the best way to do cytology and in pap smear also rather than doing this smearing of the specimen on the slide a lot of people have switched over to lbc liquid based cytology i'm sure uh, my pathologist friends will teach you better about this but liquid based cytology is not the best way of doing any cytology okay so what is this instrument which is used for uh, Okay, I'll give away a little bit. What is the instrument used for the purpose of applying the fellow bring, applying the fellow bring over the tubes? What is the instrument? Yes, this is the laparoscopic, laparoscopic ring applicator so we don't call it a laparoscopic ring applicator see the ring is uh, it's a white color ring obviously it is uh, here so what these prongs will pull the tube into the cylinder and then we slip the ring with a with a it's got a trigger to which fires the ring over the tube so it's known as a laparoscopic ring applicator so we actually call it the laparocator that's what we call it much uh, sophisticated thin instruments may come in here this is the one which i have in my hospital still and uh, i love this instrument so much because it's the same instrument by which you can enter the abdomen see also through the same instrument and apply also with the same instrument so i like this instrument a lot laparoscopic ring applicator or called the simply called the laprocator all right so good laprocator yes this is correct all right <laughs> curator was good for the sims curate that was a good one okay now, what is this? Uh, what is the criteria for diagnosing this disease? Come. This image you should know. This image uh, of the ovary tells you just one disease, PCOS. So, come on. Don't uh, tell me this is PCOS. I know you know this in your uh, in the middle of the night. I just wake you up and show you this. You'll close your eyes and say it is PCOS. Move it away. I know you know that. What is the criteria now to say PCOS? Because it has changed in the last two years. We used to say more than 12 per ovary how many per ovary let's see no 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 rotterdam criteria is for the syndrome guys i'm so sorry uh, maybe i should uh, specify what i'm asking a little better what is the criteria for not diagnosing the syndrome what is the criteria for saying that this is pcos how many follicles per ovary of this two to six millimeter size Earlier we used to say 12, which is now outdated. Now let's see. 15, <laughs> 10 to 12. Ocean of chain of pearls, 10 volume. Volume should be more than 10. That is correct, Neha. A volume of more than 10 cc is correct. A large ovary and PCS ovary. So more than 20 per ovary, guys. More than 20 per ovary. Okay? More than 20 per ovary. Good. Now, guys, this is the tough one. Uh, I remember doing this even before the uh, exam for the NEET. The same picture again. This has become a favorite picture for exams these days. Now, please tell me, in a woman who has got a normal placentation, she has all of these, the transforming growth factor, excuse me, the transforming growth factor, the vascular endothelial growth factor, which is going to do angiogenesis and make good dilated blood vessels. But some things come in the way of these growth factors and inhibit the formation of the blood vessels properly in a placenta and the placenta does not have proper angiogenesis. Blood vessels are not nice and dilated. They are in fact vasospastic. So what is the problem in preeclampsia? There is vasospasm. Now this vasospasm is brought about by some mediators which come and inhibit the angiogenesis and those two mediators have been marked here with two yellow arrows can you tell me those two mediators yes can you make an effort and tell me because we did this before the neat exam also yes guys thromboxin a2 no 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 thromboxin a2 is involved by it's a vasoconstrictor it is more in amount process cycling is less in amount so if you want i can write that thromboxin a2 is increased 
prostacyclin PGI2 is reduced in PIH. That is fine. But I am talking about what are these which come and inhibit the transforming growth factor binding from these mediators and causing vasodilation. And what is this one which binds with the vascular endothelial growth factor and prevents the angiogenesis. Yes, anybody making a MTHR, SFLT, yes, finally, Dr. Subhi Kumari, yes, correct. The SMS, yes, soluble FMS, soluble FMS like tyrosine kinase. And the second one here is endoglin. These are now tests also, guys. I'm repeatedly telling you this. Maybe INICT exam is a little milder than NEAT exam. NEAT exam, they are asking you all of these things a lot. And endoglin and SMS, sorry, SMS. That's what happens if you do too many SMS. Soluble FMS like tyrosine kinase is a, a bioannihilate now for the prediction of pH. It is being commercially done already. So you better know about endoglin and S soluble FMS like tyrosine kinase. Go ahead and read about them. They inhibit the binding of transforming growth factor and vascular endothelial growth factor these, with these mediators and they don't allow the vasodilation to happen. Okay, chalo. So this is the, this is the acronym, the short form of something which is now an acceptable acronym for one disorder. This acronym, yes, I've written it. I've shown you a palm, I've shown you a coin. This is from a very famous book. And uh, this is uh, from the, not the book, this is a journal from which I've taken. So, Obstetrics in Gynecology Journal. And uh, that's an excellent journal for us to see references. The FIGO classification has given this acronym for which major disorder? Yes, anybody in the class? Which major disorder has this acronym? Palm coin. So, palm coin is the acceptable, acceptable acronym for abnormal uterine bleeding causes. AUB causes. All right, good. A lot of you got it correct. So, if somebody has abnormal uterine bleeding, we don't say she's got a fibroid which because which she's having abnormal uterine bleeding. We just say she has. We just say she has AUBL. If she is endometrial cancer, we say AUBM. We just say AUBM. Or if she has got adenomyosis, we say AUBA. So please be on the lookout. Sometimes now they don't, they don't give you fibroid or leomyoma like that. They just say a patient is brought to you with a AUBL. The lesion is 18 centimeters and she is 42 years. What are you going to do? So, if you're going to say uh, myomectomy or if you're going to say hysterectomy, you should know that AUBL is for AUB for a leomyoma. Alright? So, go ahead and know about this. Now, come on. This is the easy one. A woman underwent ovarian hyper, uh, control ovarian hyperstimulation and now she ended up having so many follicles. Yes, that is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. This picture, I mean, the number of times it has come, I know you always got it correct. But don't miss out on this easy you know, this, uh, you know, this uh, easy cake in your hand kind of a question. Definitely just you have to go ahead and bite it. That kind of a MCQ, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So the size is, all of them are dominant, okay? Generally, you'll have one, two, three, four, five antral follicles and then a dominant follicle in an ovary like this. Now, I'm trying to do in IVF 6 to 15 eggs I want in IVF. But if it is more than 20, okay, you can't see. If it is more than 20, then total in 20, right and left ovary put together. Look here, for PCOS per ovary, PCOS per ovary more than 20. In ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, if there are totally more than 20, left and right ovary put together, if there are 20 eggs and more which are dominant, that is OHSS. Why? Because each makes 200 picograms. And into 20 is equal to 4,000 picograms. So, so much of estrogen is bad. It increases the vascular permeability. Vascular permeability. That is what is going to increase. So, that's why we say that too much of estradiol and the high HCG also. Don't forget the estradiol, estrogen I have written and increase HCG. Both are 
going to increase the vascular permeability by increasing VEGF. So, VEGF, VEGF is the reason why it is high because of the high HCG and the high estradiol and that causes the vascular permeability to increase and that causes the pleural effusion, pericardial effusion and the edema to happen. Alright, so this is the favorite question which keeps coming in spite of being it very repetitive. Alright, now what is this procedure which is going on? Come on guys, this is already shown. I mean, come on, what is this procedure going on? And which disorder I am going to do this? I am putting a needle into the ovary and when we put this needle into the ovary, we are burning the stroma of the ovary. Yes, that is what is known as the laparoscopic, laparoscopic procedure of what? Come on guys. What is that procedure? Yes, ovarian drilling. Ovarian drilling for PCOS. I am doing this procedure. Yes, we are doing this procedure to do what? To reduce the androgenic stroma, reduce the stroma. We are burning the stroma. Four to six holes. Four to six holes per ovary I will make. Four to six holes. We burn the stroma, okay? We are not burning the follicles. Don't say we are bursting the follicles, okay? That is wrong. All right, guys. Okay, guys, what is this? Can you see? The hymen is uh, not uh, perforated. It's an imperforated hymen. Yes. So what is the presentation of this patient? she is going to present with a very peculiar symptom. Come on, tell me. Okay, two symptoms you can tell me. Very interesting. One clue is already here in the picture. Yes, it's an imperfect hymen. Answer to my already, the diagnosis I've already given you. What are the complaints she's going to come to you with? Primary dysmenorrhea. Come on. Dysmenorrhea. I mean, she's not having periods. So yes, she may be having some period inside. But she won't come with dysmenorrhea. She's not having periods. So how will she say that I'm having pain during periods? Come on, guys. I know you're getting tired. Is it? Bluish bulge and no menstrual flow. Will she say that? Cyclical pain. That makes sense. So she'll have monthly pain, but no periods coming out. That is one. But can you take the hint? The hint which I'm trying to tell you is that, that this patient, yes, this patient has a uterus which is full of blood. And this vagina is getting distended and the bladder neck is in front and the sacrum is in the back. So when this, when this vagina gets filled up with so much of blood, she will compress the bladder neck. Yes, she will compress the bladder neck against the pubic symphysis. I'll, uh, I'll use another bright color for you to show that. See? She will compress the bladder neck against the pubic symphysis and she will come with urinary retention. So yes, that is the MCQ which is coming for the INICT and the NEET exam. That a woman, a young girl of 16 has come to you with uh, urinary retention acute at 2 in the morning. And incidentally, she has not attained her MINAC so far. What could be the diagnosis? So yes, on the phone sometimes my PGs ring up and tell, just make sure that she is not having an imperfect hymen. Okay, so that is what the patient may present with. So what is the treatment of an imperfect hymen? Yes, we make a cruciate incision, a cross-shaped incision. So that's what exactly what we're doing. We're making a cross-shaped incision here. You can see when we make this cross-shaped incision, then we're going ahead and making sure that all that pent-up blood comes out. Yes, that is what is happening. This woman, exactly the way I told you, uh, make a cross-shaped incision. We do that. And then after that, all this pent up blood will come out. All right, so we did a lot of MCQs along with the information which I gave you with the pictures. And I'm sure that uh, you have, you're always full of MCQs and you're always full of uh, questions. So I'm available at, uh, let's say, let's say, Dr. Prasan, Prasan at Yahoo. 
dot com and you can always send me your requests for your uh, questions and I'll be more than happy uh, unfortunately taking calls becomes a little difficult because uh, quite a few students keep calling and if I'm in a session like now I've been doing so many calls so it'll be great if you send me an email on this or on the prep ladder forum where we are always available to give you and I must answer yes last week has been a little busy so tonight onwards I start asking you answering your questions just before the exam I'll make sure that all of your uh, queries are answered on the prep ladder forum also all right Chalo. You guys uh, uh, go ahead and uh, write a very good exam. I'm sure that all of you have prepared well. Just make sure that uh, the more you practice, the more MCQs you do, you'll do better. All right. Uh, God bless and get back to me with very good results. Let's hope all of you are in the ranks and pick up an excellent PG for yourself. Bye-bye. Good evening.